computer. All right. <clears throat> Welcome to the April uh, Astro Photography Group meeting. Um, I was hoping we'd get some 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 more newbies here. You got any questions? Okay, we always start off by any issues that people are having besides Keith and with his camera, <laughs> which we think we solved it, right? He doesn't qualify. No, he, he's already he already got it fixed. I think already got it solved. <laughs> solved. Hello, hello. Hi, <laughs> I, I Keith. Uh, the, the first question always is: Have any issues our group of experts can help with? And I said you were having trouble with your camera. Oh, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, it's on its way back, and the new one's on its way here. The uh, yeah, I was getting really horrible. I don't even know if I could bring them up. I think I've deleted them all. But when I'd stack them, I would get it looked like the camera had was looking through uh, trees, as best I could describe it. And uh, anyway, I forwarded the copies to of the subs, the original subs, to uh, Merrill and Steve, and, and Steve zoomed in and goes. Well, there's a bear pattern on this. I'm like, what? <laughs> so you zoom in, and sure enough, there's a bear pattern in there. And uh, so, of course, that was totally blowing off Pixin's site. It was trying to stack, you know, a bear a bear pattern uh, sub with mono settings. And uh, so I forwarded it out to Simon out there at uh, Woodland Hills, and he set, hooks me up with the, uh, I guess, down in Santa Barbara, there's a guy that, returns or repairs the QHYs and uh anyway I called out and talked to him and he said that he had seen a mono or a color sensor installed in a mono camera before in one of their smaller ones hmm. he says well I've never seen it in a larger one I was like well now this one it. here <laughs> yeah so anyway I'm shipping it back to him and they'll take a look but he says yeah the reason it was all screwed up is because you had uh probably because you had we had mono firmware in the camera but the sensor was um, color had the bear filter on it, so the two didn't work. And anyway, they're sending me a <laughs> well, new one. And Simon says he checked it out and sent it to me. We'll we'll know next week when it gets here. Uh, Simon, of course, was afraid that all the rest of his sitting on the shelf could have the same problem. But uh, I was wondering how uh, how frequent that that occurs. I I don't know, but that would be a factory yeah. issue, I would assume. Yeah. Excellent job of troubleshooting, Steve. Yeah, we never figured it out. I I was so fresh. I would take pictures. I come in. I go, these are way off. So, well, yeah. here was I knew it was a mono camera, and I saw the bear pattern. So I said, no way. Uh, they 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 would not solder a, you know, <laughs> in that thing. And then Merrill. Actually yeah, debated, debated the uh yeah, he actually debated, debated the, and there was yeah yeah <laughs> and simon did too out in california he he took the the uh luminance stacked one and debared it he's like okay it's not supposed to do this not send, supposed it to it back. <laughs> send it back <laughs> you know, three channels okay any other besides one we got solved already anybody else having issues that folks can help with I have an issue, but it's a very basic issue. I um, I just need help to align my images that I took for the eclipse, and to be able, um, I mean, and to be able to, um, I mean, work with Photoshop. So I have a little bit of experience with Photoshop, but they have changed the version now that they have gone to basically CC, and everything that I knew with Photoshop has been changed. But, you know, this is something very basic. And if I could just find one person and we can go through one set of images with me, but we don't need to do it now. Uh, you know, I think, I mean, that would be very helpful to me. I'm, I'm looking at one on the screen, at least one on the screen. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Brent, do you want to, can you uh, do that or? Um... Yeah, um, I can. Uh... Sunita, if you want to uh, connect on the, the Slack channel, we can try sure. to carve out some time and um, take a look at what you got got sure. going. Sure, that would be great. Thank you. Any any new other, I mean, Sunita is a new member as well, but any, any of our new members have things that want help on that we can uh, get you hooked up the right people? Now I'm wondering what's a good YouTube video to stack some images in Pixinsight of the eclipse. You know, I've watched a lot of 
I mean, YouTube videos yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll talk about it in a little bit, but I, I couldn't get PixInsight to do anything nice with my pictures. I, I did it all in <laughs> Photoshop. <laughs> I used GIMP for all mine. Yep. I, I've I talked guess to Pix Insight's too smart. Yeah. For, I, I've for talked this. to Pix Insight ambassadors, and they say uh, that they don't use Pix Insight to to do that type of work. Okay. Even, <laughs> even though the functionality is there, the, uh, there's better free stuff out there. Gotcha. Okay. I just uh, downloaded PIP. Uh, today, but I haven't used it yet to try to align my images uh, of a time lapse that I did. Um, I did use PixInsight actually from a time lapse perspective. The uh, FFT is it FFT transform or or FFT alignment? I forget what the action is, but FFT something and PixInsight uh, that did a really good job of aligning when I did my um, coverage time lapse. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean picks inside of it. PIPP. -P -P. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I didn't do any alignment for, PIP. Videos yeah. made uh, so in AVI format. Oh, okay, are we going to cover this in, in either Rick or Rick or Brent's your, your presentation? How you how you did that? Any. Uh, I'll I'll talk to it. I admit we'll have some opportunities probably to dig into it more. Okay. Any any other new member questions? Okay. Well, the big the big event that happened just recently was the the eclipse, and we've got some a couple of good pr uh, presentations with Rick and Brent. And anybody else wants to ch chime in too, because this is a lot of people did some really good work that I saw on the Slack channel. So we're going to start off with Rick talk about his um, uh, trip to Mexico and uh, and then Brent, you, you're going to talk about just what you took. Plus, you got some other uh, information to share. So, Rick, you want to take over? I'm, I'm, I'll stop sharing. Uh, does everybody see the agenda? This this is what we're following. I assume they're seeing the agenda. Yes. Good. OK. All right. I'm stopping sharing. Rick, it's all yours. All right. Let me uh, grab the right screen. Okay, so uh, I guess most of you know that uh, I went to Torreon, Mexico with um, the uh, a group of people and a production company uh, working with the Exploratorium Museum out of San Francisco. Um, uh, very similar to what we did last, um, uh, what was it, October in Ely, Nevada, uh, except, of course, it's out of the country. And uh, we had, uh, and this time, instead of providing all four telescopes, I only had to provide two, the wide field views. Uh, the place where, we, where they had it is a uh, planetarium at uh, Ely. I mean, at uh, Torreon, and they have uh, telescopes. Let me see if I got, you know, I I honestly, and I apologize, I really didn't take that many pictures because, one, I was busy working, <laughs> and when it got down to doing solar stuff, I was shooting video and not pictures. Uh, where are the domes? There is a shot in here somewhere with the, with the observatory domes. But anyway, they have two pretty good size observatories, one with a 10 inch uh, refractor, and then a 90, and the other one had a 90 millimeter um, uh, Coronado telescope. And they had, uh, they were doing the close up white light imaging with the 10 inch refractor and the uh, close up hydrogen alpha with their 90 millimeter Coronado. And instead of using the kind of cameras that we use for astrophotography, these are studio grade, um, you know, broadcast grade uh, video cameras. And but they're but they're tiny, uh, little C mount cameras, um, pretty good sized chips in them, 
high resolution, small uh, micron pixels. And uh, a lot of the trick going into this took months of working. The, and plus, all those cameras hook up to special software. So they're, they're USB outputs. Uh, the production crew had uh, a layout of a computer for each telescope, and they had this special software that one of their uh, production engineers wrote uh, that does a lot of things, including colorize it, because these cameras are all black and white, and they provide the color that's used in the, in the images. Uh, we got... Uh, frame size finally set where it was big enough to get the whole disk of the sun in the uh, in these telescopes and yet still be able to have a high enough frame rate over USB to to suit the uh, broadcast video world requirements. Uh, basically, let me uh, and this this I, I will tell you the uh, this is me starting to unpack here where have i got another picture of i so <clears throat> this is they decorated this place for the eclipse and you can see in the they've got exploratorium and nasa i want to tell you it was a huge monumental deal to the people of torreon mexico that nasa was there I mean, it was huge. They treated me like a god. I I signed T-shirts after the after the eclipse for an hour or two. After uh, as we're trying to break down equipment and get it all packed up, I got kids, teenagers, and adults coming up to me to sign their T-shirts. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to be a rock star when I was young, but I never made it that far. That was that was huge. Uh, that, that's that jump from amateur to professional uh, master <laughs> photographer, right, Rick? That's it. That's it. Everybody wants to grow up and be a rock star. Uh, this was essentially my. This is my setup when I first got there. This is the other thing. So when when we do these, we get there three days before the event. First day is set up. Get all the equipment set up. Get the generators set up. Get the production truck set up. Get the radar. Radar, the satellite uplink transmitter and truck and antenna all set up. And this is that day, that day. And you can see it's cloudy, right? So I get the equipment set up. I got a little monitor here that I try to use to focus the telescopes with and what have you. Uh, typically, or what I've done in the past, is I'll come back that first evening and do a polar alignment of the mount. Right. So I get everything set up. I got a spare telescope here with my uh, ASI 071 camera. I've got an ASI air on here. I was going to just come back and do a quick sol uh, polar alignment uh, using that equipment that night. But it was socked in clouds, all clouds. That's that was all day. We flew Thursday. That's all day Friday clouds. Saturday and Sunday are rehearsal days for the for the uh, what they call the talent, the people that are going to be there talking to the event, uh, standing in front of the uh, production cameras and what have you, and uh, and and also the time for us to work out all the details in our hardware and getting everything set up for the. And typically, what I did is use those days to find focus uh, to. Uh, we use SDO uh, imaging from NASA to determine how to uh, align, set up the scopes so that the uh, solar north is solar north on every telescope. So you got four telescopes there, and when you switch from one to the other, you don't want the image of the sun to rotate, right? So that takes a few hours of, of trying to get everything lined up, which which we did late Sunday because uh, that was the first time we got a break in the clouds it was late Sunday night, late Sunday afternoon. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Of any interest. 
haven't seen a satellite dish that big for anything in a long time. So I'm going to guess this is old technology. And given how much trouble we had with some of their other equipment, this was a, a production company out of Mexico City. And uh, their intercom system just was terrible. Uh, a couple other things were quite problematic. Um, it's just old tech. Uh, let's see, let me. Although this was kind of cute in their in their observatory, uh, in the planetarium, they had a video projector mounted on the ceiling, pointed at this half dome thing on the wall. It kind of made it look like the sun. I thought that was just cute as snot. <laughs> uh, let's see. So here's uh, the production setup. These are the four computers that are con talking to the cameras. Uh, and then the rest of this is all production gear. And this is the, let's see, he's the producer. The director is actually out in that, uh, uh, this truck, right? Where, where's the truck? Oh, it says this truck right here. Uh, this is uh, University of, uh, well, the, the University in Mexico City. They're out here, and they had they came to 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 this planetarium, to this observatory in Torreon because of all the hoopla and everything to conduct a radio experiment. This is a NASA conducted uh, experiment in broadcast propagation. Uh, uh, having to do with ion, ionosphere, ionosphere changes during the eclipse. And they set up uh, this experiment to receive signals that were being transmitted and uh, participate in that experiment as well, because it was NASA. <laughs> uh, this is our own site. Uh, that She was our big boss. She was there to cover everything, and she did a wonderful job. Let me see. Oh, this is somebody's stashed uh, 70, uh, 71 Mustang Boss 302, I think, a replica thereof, uh, stuck in there that I could see from my hotel window. This, the, the, uh, the, the city was, is odd. There's not a, there's very, there's almost no pitch roofs in the entire town everything's a flat roof you know, which tells you immediately it doesn't rain much and it never snows right so uh pretty odd everything looks not quite finished you know everything's constructed out of cinder block uh there's no other kind of framework going on uh, uh but the people were wonderful they uh uh let's see. So here, here's my setup. Uh, this is, yeah, I think this is what I actually went to product, went to live with. So the Coronado, we wound up using the Coronado PST. Uh, I had to lay it over on its side to get it to line it to, to produce the correct image. Uh, this is a uh, zoom camera lens with a doubler on it to do. Uh, the white light and they want that so they can do the zoom work and they control the zoom from inside the production uh trailer <laughs> and uh these are the cameras uh this one is the one by FLIR I forget who the manufacturer of this one is uh this is my um uh, William Optic 70 millimeter and uh I I've wound up uh, using it more to uh, center the sun, find the sun as a solar finder, because I'd use it as a project, eyepiece projection uh, onto a piece of cardboard to see where I was at. I didn't use ASI Air at all, as it turned out. I just connected directly to the mount and drove it from there. And this guy showed up with this uh, six-inch uh refractor carbon fiber uh and set up outside this became a circus at one point so on this on on uh 
on eclipse day there was three thousand people around this planetarium uh lots of music going on a couple of guys with asi mounts and and you know red cat telescopes and zwo cameras and stuff I, Maybe get some more pictures of that. Of course, we had uh, this guy. <laughs> I don't know what that guy is, but uh, God bless him for, for being there. <laughs> uh, let's see. That's uh, Dave, the producer. Good guy. I enjoyed working with him. Uh, Here is a high-end, outdoor, visible uh high resolution TV monitor that I used to be able to see focus and what I was what was coming out of my cameras. Uh, this is just a uh, you know cell phone shot of what's showing up there. Um, this was uh, well I'm clouded out right so my hydrogen and my white light are both blank. This is the SDO reference image. That we were using from NASA to know to get all the rest of the telescopes pointed uh, solar north. Uh, let's see, is there anything else here of any, any significant interest? Yeah, this is kind of the setup, right? So I had to, the uh, telescopes here, this high resolution monitor with sunshade there. Uh, this monitor was effectively useless. Um, and I got to tell you, uh, it was uh, the humidity there was very low. It was in the upper 80s, low 90s. But I mean, when the sun when the sun came out, it was brutal. Uh, it, I, I swear, they're closer to the sun there than we are. In fact, I was beginning to wonder if the moon had actually covered it up since it got much much closer. It was hot. <laughs> Let's see what else have I got. <laughs> All right, so and I'm sure a lot of you've seen this, and I hope everybody knows that this is fake. I keep getting people going, "Isn't that beautiful? How does it do that?" And I said, "It'll do that right after it eats the Earth." I said, "Anything yes. that <laughs> the corona sphere of the sun to do such a trick." Would have would have eliminated us from ever watching it. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, so, so the so the deal was we got up Sunday morning and we were still in clouds. And the primary team from the exploratorium was in Junction, Texas, and they had clear they had a clear spot in the sky, and or prior to totality they were the ones providing images uh for the exploratorium and about five minutes in, in fact going into totality about five minutes before our skies started to clear up and and we were getting images and we were looking pretty good and just as totality happened junction clouded over and they did not get unclouded for the rest of the day so this is the, um, if you want to look at uh, YouTube uh, Exploratorium, this is, these fees are all on their uh, YouTube channel. They've got a bunch of the uh, talent uh, feeds. This is, this is just the general live coverage. This is the telescope feed from Torreon. This is the one from Junction. Of course, this is the one I'm, uh, I'm going to show you because this is my stuff. I want to. I want to say this. I, I had. Uh, I had our our DVR here record every program here in Memphis, so that was uh, doing something on the eclipse. I got NBC, CBS, ABC, and the Weather Channel, and all of them. You when it when it came to totality and that f first event, all of them were showing my telescopes. <laughs> I am a rock star. Did you sign my T-shirt?
Oh, did I share? Uh, hold on. Yeah, you are sharing the audio. You got the audio? Yes. Okay. All right. So, all right. So this is our, uh, uh, the planetarium's hydrogen alpha. I'm getting things situated and having to uh, adjust tracking. Like I said, I never got polar alignment. So it kind of drifts out. Yeah, not real quick, but since the clouds are moving in, you can see it dim out. Yes. All right, this is the planetarium's white light and that big 10 inch. And they'll use that right up until. Now, that's my hydrogen alpha. And then when we switch to the white light, it's just as I'm pulling the filter off the uh, off the camera lens. Back to uh, the planetarium or their white light. It may be their white light at this point. I actually have a two terabyte hard drive coming. It's got all the individual camera feeds. So this is a mixed feed that we, was actually transmitted up to the satellite. Okay, this is close. Here's the crowd. All right, clouds are moving out some more. It's a little bit brighter. All right, that's my hydrogen alpha. Now we'll switch to my white light if this starts to burn. You hear it? Bam! This is my white light. The diamond ring and baby blue. Turns the sensitivity of some, and at this point he overdoes it. I wish he hadn't been quite that far with But that's what the world saw from every one of those uh, live video feeds for these other networks. So, uh, so at this point, we we were good, and, and we were, we had uh, good decent skies pretty much the rest of the morning. You know, at uh, the rest of the afternoon, we followed it all the way through to uh, fourth contact, and and then signed off, and the videos are all there. Um, you you if you see uh, in some of the early. Let's see, early hydrogen alpha. If we get anything, that's clouds, clouds, clouds. Got a little hint of uh, of uh, Newton rings in both the small one and the the big one. This isn't bad, but uh, the problem was we just didn't have enough time ahead of. <laughs> do anything about it i have i have actually got two adapters that are designed specifically for taking out newton rings by being two curved surfaces that allow you to put a tilt in the sensor and uh those things weren't cheap <laughs> but uh, we didn't use them because uh, we just didn't, wasn't able to get to it you can sell them now huh? <laughs> yeah i could <laughs> so uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, most of the imaging challenges were worked out ahead of the day. Uh, like I said, we had to work on some uh, frame rates and uh, image size and sensors. These um, uh, We did not use the full sensor 
array. We uh, scaled it down to get the frame rate we needed out of it. And uh, those little cameras are about 4,000 bucks a piece. Uh, what else? That's that's about all I can think of to share with you, except that it was a wonderful time. It was great people. Um, the the people of Torreon, like I said, treated us like gods. Uh, it was great. The people I worked with on this uh, exploratorium team and the production crew are wonderful folks. They were easy to work with, smart, uh, just a lot of fun. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, Policia Nacional, uh, they, uh, the municipal police, nobody was too concerned about, but these guys ride around, they say, you know, they're, those guys are serious <laughs> and they are because they're fully armed. And, uh, but with all that said, the five days I was there, I saw a truck like this and fully loaded, uh, at the airport as we were leaving. And then this, uh, these guys from my hotel window. So uh, not not a whole lot of it. Didn't hear any gunfire while I was there, probably less than you hear in Memphis. Uh, and so it was, all in all, I felt pretty safe and uh, a lot of fun to be there, a lot of fun to do that. It was a blast. And what seven was your uh, duration of totality? Four minutes and a few seconds. We weren't the first. I thought we were going to be the first. As it turns out, uh, there was uh, my my. Mazatlan, Maz I don't know how you pronounce that. There was a Mazatlan. Huh? Mazatlan. Mazatlan had a uh, production crew there uh, providing a satellite feed. I don't know who they were there with, but uh, uh, this they, there was a crew there. Of course, you're not going to get any earlier than that without being out here in a boat. So <laughs> they beat us to being first, but uh, we had a good... Uh, Begin of totality. Then the other crew uh, that was with us was were in Junction, and that's right here. This is where they were. And then, of course, by the time you got into Arkansas, north of uh, forty, apparently everything was pretty clear. So maybe somebody got over there and and tried my. Uh, uh, Petagene Mountain experiment with a high-speed imaging, see if I can catch the, the leading edge of the shadow, zoom across that valley. <clears throat> I hadn't heard from Jeremy. He just saw a couple of uh, posts on Facebook, uh, but he chickened out and went to up north, Maine, someplace in Maine. So... But that's about all I got. If anyone's got any questions, I'll try to answer them. I will tell you, I've never had a double wrapped uh, tamale before, uh, but I but I will tell you, these are the best tamales I've ever eaten in my life. They were absolutely delicious. I don't know how they do it, but they sure know how to make good Mexican food in Mexico. <laughs> All right. All right. Great. Well, good. Good job, Rick, and uh, real proud of you being a MAS MASFIS actually uh, representing the world to us for us. <laughs> okay, um, Brent, would you like to uh, show your show your stuff? Yeah. Let's see if I can get my screen share coming. All right. Is that coming across? Yeah. All right. What's so, good, cool. Um, 
Yeah, so my my experience, so this was my my first uh, Eclipse imaging session. Uh so uh pretty pretty excited. Again, I want to say special thanks to Freddie for arming me with all the the knowledge he had. I I went back and watched some of the prep videos uh in the days leading up to make sure I had all my my checklist ready to go, but um like everybody else, I was watching the weather and uh, I woke up about um 3 a.m. on Monday. Uh, I didn't know where I was going at that point. I could have started driving toward Texas, could have gone to Arkansas, would have gone up to Ohio. Just I would have gone anywhere that it looked good. But as we were looking at the weather, um, that North Arkansas kind of sliver was looking pretty good. So I ended up driving over to uh, Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. Um, got there pretty early. Uh, got to this park at about 6, uh, uh, 6 a.m. and went ahead and set up. Uh, and then what I'm sharing here is the setup that I, I took. Um, I used my William Optics uh, 70 millimeter uh, Zenith Star. So it was about a 430 millimeter focal length. Uh, had my solar filter. I used my ASI 071 uh, MC camera as well for this. Um, I did set up my guide scope, which I'm, I'm going to talk to a little bit. Rick, you might have uh, taken some advantage of the new tool that I used uh, for this for uh, solar tracking with the guide scope. Um, but I got uh, got set up and used that, and then I used it on my EQ6R uh, tracking mount. Uh, I did all of my captures in sharp cap, which I'll, I'll show you exactly how I did that in just a moment. And then, like I mentioned, uh, I did solar tracking in PHD2, which was really a game changer. You know, I got my rough uh, alignment in the daytime, uh, turned on that tracking, and it kept me solid throughout the entire thing. Um, it was it was really a, a an awesome uh, tool. So there we go. Uh, weather was. Even as the shape of the object changed, it was able to track it. Yeah, um, yeah, it was. Uh, it, it's a pretty impressive tool, and I'll I'll, yeah. I'll show some stuff on it here in a little bit. But cool. uh, I'll just talk to it to begin with. But yeah, our our sky. Um, you know, we had these kind of wispy uh, white clouds the whole time. Uh, it looked like it was going to stick around the whole time. Then, literally five minutes before. Uh, first contact, it just opened up clear blue everywhere. It, it was really just amazing uh, experience that all of that cleared up. When I got there at 6 a.m., I was one of the first few people there. Uh, one of the next people that got there that pulled up uh, with his family was a meteorologist from uh, Louisiana. So um, I was like, all right, I'm going to have some inside information here. And so he was pulling up some of his uh, detailed radars and kind of giving projections on why he thought it would all clear out. So I was like, OK, I, I think I'm in a good place. We're going to we're going to stick here and, and wait it out. And sure enough, uh, it all worked out um, at that point. So. Going into it, like I said, this this is my first time imaging Eclipse. Um, I've only just recently got started in solar, which I'll, I'll talk about that after I talk my Eclipse stuff. Uh, I, I really had two goals. My first one was I, I want to capture some really nice images. I've seen what what others have done, and I want to walk away um, with with some things that I'm really happy with. Uh, in particular, I was looking at the the Eclipse process. I knew I wanted to do a time lapse of that. And then during totality, I, I wanted a nice totality picture. I wanted to try to get the diamond ring. I wanted to try to get Bailey's beads. And I kind of stopped my expectations at, at that. I was like, if I can walk away with these things, I'll, I'll be you know, more than happy. So the other goal was I, I really wanted to experience as much of that experience as I could in, in person. So I really wanted to focus on automation. And using the PHD2 solar tracker and then the sharp cap um, sequencing, uh, I was pretty much able to press go at the beginning and not touch it again. I spot checked it from time to time, but from beginning to end, I just had three little sets of automation that, uh, that ran and did everything for me. And with PHD2's um, uh, solar tracking, uh, like I said, I, I spot checked it every now and then, but it kept me right on path throughout the entire uh, entire time. And uh, Leo Leo Schatz is the the name of the developer that did that. He specifically did a lot of testing for coverage to make sure that that tracking, even if it had a partial circle, it would stick with it. And uh, and from my perspective, it worked uh, worked like a champ. 
So what I was looking to do was uh, from C uh, first contact to, to C2, I wanted to capture one frame every 60 seconds so that I could do a, a decent time lapse. So that was my first little bit of automation. Then once totality hit, uh, I, I kind of had a sequence that I was going to start. So about 15 to 20 seconds before uh, C2, I was going to start trying to capture that diamond ring about four seconds before C2, and then going four seconds after, I was going to try to capture the, the Bailey's beads. Uh, and then after that, I was going to do my bracket capture so I could do an HDR image. So I had about, uh, I think, 10 uh, different settings. Uh, I, I actually went way too low, uh, but all the way up to one second. And I maybe could have gone um, longer than that. But uh, so I did my bracket captures until about four seconds prior to third contact uh, and then four seconds after. So within that eight second window, I was trying to capture the, the Bailey's beads on the back end and then going about 15 to 20 seconds after third contact to get that next diamond ring. Then finally put the solar cat filter back on and uh, work my way through another frame for every 60 seconds so I could time lapse it on the way out. So what I'm showing here is what the sequencer looked like. Um, this is what it looks like inside of, uh, of SharpCap um, Pro. And then this is what it actually looks like from a, a code perspective. So basically, it's just uh, this was my totality sequence. Um, it's basically setting all the parameters, setting my file names. But I've got a couple blocks here. Basically, it was a loop. Uh, for this one, here's, um, which one is this? This is the first diamond ring. So I basically said I want to capture uh, multiple frames uh, throughout this, uh, this time period until 154.47. Uh, then I did my loop for the Bailey's beads. Then I did my loop for the uh, uh, bracketing. Went through, a, again, another time, did my loop for the Bailey's beads on the back end. And then my loop for the the diamond ring uh, on the back end. So it's one of those things that I, I tested the timing of it uh, for weeks leading up to the event. Uh, I knew what it would do. I didn't know how it would turn out. Uh, but as I was able to kind of spot check as it was going on and I was seeing nice looking pictures on my, uh, my screen, um, I started getting really excited. <laughs> so um, when all was said and done, I, I had multiple hundreds of, of captures and I, I went you know, as soon as I got home that night, which was quite a trip back from, from Arkansas, I stayed up way too late again after getting up way too early, just kind of going ahead and messing with, uh, with the data. But um, some of my results. So this was my, uh, this is my HDR version of uh, totality. So I'm continuing to mess with this, but I, I'm pretty happy with how this is, uh, this is starting to turn out. But I, I did a HDR combination of the bracketed images uh, in Photoshop uh, for this one. So a lot of different techniques and um, continuing to work on it and get it to this point. So, you know, with just, just this, I think I would have been pretty happy. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot better out there, but uh, I, I'm super thrilled to, to have something like this. Uh, diamond ring um, turned out pretty good. I, I had some that were more overexposed, but I, that had a lot more of that kind of lens flare type piece. But I, I liked this one. It didn't have too much of a flare, and I, I liked the size of it. Um, so this was my my first diamond ring uh, at C2. This one I was really excited about because, um, again, you got that small window to try to get the uh, – the Bailey's beads showing here, but uh, I managed to capture this one and uh, I'm pretty happy with uh, the beads showing here. Um, so that was pretty exciting uh, to, to see how that one turned out. Uh, the next one, between this one and the next one I'll show, uh, I was actually really surprised at, at something. I, I, didn't, I didn't expect this to be able to see the prominences with your own eyes. Um, and, and even in the pictures, I, I don't know, it didn't cross my mind that that would be something that I would be capturing. So this being my first time. So once I started to see it, and, and again, seeing it with your own eyes and, and being around people that were asking, you know, hey, what's that pinkish thing? I was like, I know what that is. Um, it, it was really an amazing uh, a thing to see. So that was the beads. Uh, and then um, 
this one kind of toward the the back end, seeing these real uh, real pronounced prominences. Yes, you know, yes. you can see the entire loop. Um, just you know, incredible uh, to be able to process these and, and see those uh, those results. That one got bigger. That uh, mm -hmm. V shape prominence got bigger after uh, after totality. Nice. Yeah, that's that's really uh, that's really exciting. Uh, I know this one down here. That one was the mm -hmm. the big one that everybody was really talking about because you could really see that one. Um, you know, just with your own eyes. This one was, uh, I, I, I didn't, wasn't aiming for it. I kind of knew about it, but I didn't try specifically for it, but I did some stretching. Um, it, yes, it's a little faint, right. but it's, it's there. So I got the earth shine a little bit. I can see the, the details of the, the moon yes. itself. So I was pretty excited. Uh, like I said, just happened to go stretch one of my, my longer exposures. And I was like, I think I can see something. So really happy to, to be able to capture that as well. Uh, and then I also, uh, with the, the automations that I did, I wanted to do that end-to-end -end, uh, time lapse. So I went ahead and kind of put it together. Uh, let's see if this will play. So hopefully that's that's coming across, but uh, yes. yep. Excellent. There was a, a little jump, if you noticed, uh, going from, from C1 to C2. I, I had to do my meridian flip at that point, so I, I missed a couple minutes while I was getting that done. But, uh, you know, just kind of showed a few of my, my totality picks. I need to update some of them since I continued to update my HDR image. And then I, I stayed and just kind of let, uh, let it track out. So all in all, um, I, I, I couldn't be more excited with kind of what I got. Again, this was my, my first, first go at it. So it was a really, really cool experience. Um, the fact that I was able to do all of the automation made it pretty exciting uh, as well, uh, as I was pretty much able to kind of visit with people the entire time. A lot of people were real curious about the setup. So I was able to talk to them about my, my mount, my telescope, um, was able to kind of give them information, uh, talked a little bit about the, the Memphis um, Astronomical Society or MassFits team. So I got to talk about what we do and the groups that we're in. Um, got to meet a lot of a lot of different people from all over the place. I think the furthest I, I met some people that came from London uh, and happened to end up in, in Walnut Ridge. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's just kind of a, a really cool experience that uh, I could kind of visit and meet with people. And I only really had to spot check everything uh, and just every so often to make sure it was doing what it was it was supposed to do. So a lot of preparation ahead of time, uh, kind of resulting in uh, a, a really fun, fun experience. So, but that, yeah, that was my, my eclipse experience. I, I know I've got more stuff that I'll talk about for solar processing, but I'll, I'll pause here so we can kind of talk more about eclipse stuff before I get into to that stuff. So I think you need to send that image to Steve so he can go out in our next uh, MAS newsletter. I really like this one. The yeah, it's composite. It, it's already happening, Rick. <laughs> there you go. I, I figured as soon as I posted it in, uh, <laughs> online. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to have links to that to our website showing the, the, the live video as well. Uh, oh, cool. So there's, there's been a lot of... It's not just Brian. There's a lot of people in this group that's done a spectacular job yeah. capturing some of this stuff. Yeah, I'd like so, to open it up to anybody else who wants to share their their highlights. I do. I do have a question for Brent. Uh, what was your heart doing during that flip, that Meridian flip? <laughs> I, I really wasn't worried about it. Just because you're kidding me. <laughs> I mean the the fact that it was in between C1 and C2 and I had probably a good 30 minutes to get it back on track. Uh, I wasn't too worried about it at that point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I actually had a crowd around me cause I, I told them what I was going to do. And all of a sudden there were about 20 people that were like, Oh, I got to see this. So it actually turned into more of a show and maybe that <laughs> made it easier for me to not think about it or worry about it. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Anybody? Hey, really quick, uh, does anybody know, so 
the sun is white, right? But the solar prominences, we can see that they're pink or red. Does anybody know why they're pink or red when the sun is white? It's, it's alpha. Well, the sun isn't really white. Yeah, I yeah. think it's a temperature effect. Yes, yeah. it's, the, it's the light that is H alpha. That's the reason with uh, why with a H alpha telescope you can see them. They are that color. The they're, sun they're peaks cool. in the yellow green, but the prominences are cooler, so they peak in a lower or longer wavelength. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Anybody else want to share some experiences? I can share mine, but th there are few <laughs> and less quality than Brent. Brent did a great job. Yes, he did. You want, Thank you. You want to you want to take over for a few minutes, Freddie? Or yeah, so is it just a a few pictures? Uh, okay. Let me do something. I'm gonna read. Okay. I th uh huh. So let me see if I can share here. Oh yeah. Okay. So um. This oh okay. This is my setup. I did a mix. Uh, as you can see, I have a wide light telescope here that Rick uh, recognizes. Um, here, do you see my mouse? By by the way. Yes. Okay, here there is the H alpha telescope that I left only for visual. And then there is uh, William Optics on wide light. And there is the, this is the camera uh, with a zoom lens on 17 millimeters that was supposed to capture the, the planets and the sun. Uh, they were both aligned to be north up. And uh, as you see, this one is a little bit offset in relation to the other one because the sun has to be a little bit offset from the center of the frame to capture Jupiter and Venus. And uh, this was a blast because people was able to see in H alpha the prominences and then come here and see in white light. And uh, it, it was it was very interesting. Uh, here is a picture of, uh, I mean, the visitor from Mass, this came with Sarita, and they also had a good time watching the clips. How many he, How many scouts were there, Freddie? Uh, I heard that there were uh, like a thousand. Okay, cool. Um, we didn't have many scouts during the day, but the night before, there, had, there was a star party. And there were so many people that I just pointed my scope to the Orion Nebula and didn't move until they called the lights out. Uh, I would say I have 150 people watching through my scope that night. Wow. Yes. Uh, for the uh, for the eclipse, they had the, uh, the scouts gather around the place where the uh, flags are. And not many... Not many scouts came during the day to, to see on my telescope, but a lot of the parents and that kind of stuff came. Okay, here is my uh, diamond ring. Uh, let me, come on. Okay, let me close this one. Here is my diamond ring. As you see, there is, uh, it's a little bit soft in focus, but there is a lot of like a veil, a white veil, and those were the clouds that uh, messed up all my photos. And uh, I have an, the picture from Venus. Uh, what happened here, the camera flipped the, uh, from portrait to landscape and cropped the image. So uh, this is Venus, this is the sun, and you see the amount of cloud we had, those those were a mess, and Jupiter should be here, but as the, my, the camera crop it, I lost it. Okay, let me close here, and I have a wide angle. What is it? Let me see. Oh, the wide angle is not here. Okay, let me. I have a couple more images. Give me one second. Bear with me.
Ah, what is it? Oh, I move it somewhere and it's not there anymore. Well, let me go to the final here. I'm gonna show this last one. Uh, this was uh, the sunset on, on coming back to Memphis. I wasn't tired of taking images of the sun. I said, okay, let me take this one. <laughs> so this was after the eclipse, of course. It was like seven, seven at night. What, was that it. one moving or were you in the standstill oh, traffic? No, no, yet? it was moving. It was with the phone. <laughs> uh, let me show again. What is it? Anybody else want to share something? Yeah, it was moving. You can see here. Uh, it's blurry and the back is... Okay. I had one. Well, I, I don't find it. I, w I will share it later once I find it. I move it somewhere. Let me stop sharing. Okay. Anyone else like to share anything? I have a few uh, things. Yeah. Experience. yeah, let's let's do it. Is... Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I had an unusual experience. Uh, I found a place uh, called, in, near the city of Clinton, Arkansas, in a graveyard. And I thought I was going to be the only one there. And, and uh, as time progressed, eventually maybe 20 or 30 people showed up in that isolated little graveyard. <laughs> but one of the things that I experimented with uh, was like, Brent, I had a goal. I'd always heard that the temperature dropped during uh, an eclipse, but I mm -hmm. never knew how much or uh, what kind of an impact it had on temperature. So I bought a little uh, Wi-Fi phone app unit and attached it to my tripod and put a, a little bit of a sun shield in front of it so the sun wouldn't influence. And it recorded temperature every minute. So I started it around noon and then finished up around 2.30 or 3. And I've got the data and everything. I just haven't grafted it yet. But what it's showing... <clears throat> is the high where I was was 83 degrees and it dropped to 70 degrees. I had my daughter wow. with me and I remember her asking, uh, I need a coat. You know, it got it got very chilly at, when that uh, shadow passed. So that was, uh, once I get the data grafted all, uh, I'll get it out to everybody or I'll put it on the web and look at it, so. But anyway, oh, that's, that's that neat. Was, uh, besides the pictures and uh, uh, whatever everybody else was doing, I, I just ventured into the temperature experiment and to see what happened. Yeah, I made a I made a mental note to notice it, which I, I feel like I did. But it, it's cool to see the measurements of it. Yeah. Well, it's well, funny it's that you mentioned. It's funny it's that you funny mentioned that the uh I guess, I guess the Okay. Adam, you want to talk oh is it Milan that wanna do this? Uh you know, here we go. Am I the only one experiencing Milan. feedback? Oh. <laughs> Uh, paired it to. It's likely that Adam has two devices. Nope. Uh, it's just me. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, let's. Can we mute everybody just and then unmute whoever's going to talk? Uh, okay. I don't know how to do that. Uh, oh. How about now? Oh yes. yeah. Now you're now you're cooking. All right. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned the cemetery. Uh, so I went to Jackman, Maine. I was going to go to Holton, Maine, which is basically the top of Maine. Um, at about uh, midnight, uh, I changed my plans to go to Jackman, Maine, which is a little bit further uh, south, uh, because I thought that Holton, Maine would just be uh, a little too crowded. And it turns out it, it was definitely crowded. But Jackman, Maine wasn't necessarily a better option. Um, because it was already a small town. So 900 people, uh, residents, and about 20,000 people were there. 
So as soon as I got there, it was really crowded. So I went to uh, a back road and I saw a few cars parked uh, by a cemetery. And we ended up having about 50 to 100 people there. Uh, also, uh, there was some talk about the shadow bands because uh, we had really clear skies. So we were uh, expecting them and there was snow on the ground because uh, it's Maine. Uh, we didn't see any shadow bands in the snow, though, even though they say it's like a light colored surface. We saw them running down the road and that was just amazing. The temperature probably dropped at least uh, 10 degrees. That was amazing. Uh, but but this is my first total solar eclipse. And uh, I just want to say that all the photos that I've looked at um, does not do it justice. Like every iteration and uh, it's just it looks so real when I was there. And I was like, I got it. I got to see another one. So I, I don't know if I can wait all the way till uh, 2044. <laughs> Spain's the next one in two years. Yes. Yeah, I may uh, I may take a flight to uh, Madrid, Spain, and maybe Egypt the year after that. There you go. Okay. Uh, Mylon, did you have something? Uh, yeah, I... Uh... Uh, Sorry, I don't have the image on my computer, so I'm trying to use my phone. I think he muted himself. Yeah, he's muted. I got a few pictures I took. So. Yeah, I'm having trouble with the, uh, the images are not on the computer that I'm using, and on the computer, there is an option for share screen. I'm not seeing that on my phone. So the images are on the phone. <laughs> but I have a video. Uh, I was at Kayakima. And uh, in the video, as I pan around 360 degrees, you can see uh, both Venus, uh, of course, the eclipse sun, and Jupiter uh, in the video, uh, just iPhone. And I had another iPhone sitting away, uh, way back behind our group to get all the group. Uh, including, you know, Sarita's group and Freddie and myself and uh, John Jernigan. And, uh, you know, just to get the it, uh, the people reactions, <laughs> uh, which is pretty cool. Outstanding. Well, I, I, okay, I found the image. If you don't mind, sure. uh, the, the image of the whole totality. Uh, 300, uh, 360 degrees. Let me let me share that for a second. And um, here you can see, uh, you can see Venus here. And uh, as you see, we had a lot of clouds, and it was not that dark. Uh, it was dark because, as you see here, the, the basketball court got the lights on automatically. And uh, but that's it. No, no, the clouds were too, too, uh, wisp, those wispy clouds, and most of them, no wispy clouds, those were uh, uh, airplane trails, a lot of them. And it, it, the, it looks like the sky up, up there was so static that they didn't dissipate at all. Cool. Okay. Well, I had a, Brent caused me to think about a kind of a heart pounding moment. Uh, I let me see if I share my screen here just a second. Uh, I did. Um, um, can you see? You see? Yes. Okay, Stelina. There you are. See, I, I see. I took Stelina with me, not knowing exactly how that would work, and um, it it worked really well. And I placed it on my son. I, I was at my son's house there at Grish Ferry, and I placed it. Did a lot of thinking, uh, placing it just right. And about um, 12, what, it was 1.30, yeah, the shadow of a tree started cre creeping up to it. And by <clears throat> about 15 minutes till, I said, crap. So, so I had to shut it down and move it 10 feet. But I did get some, um, um, get some decent images. I actually have, uh, Stelina captures all this stuff. I have, I have 4,600 images i don't know what to do with maybe i'll ask brand or somebody to take a look at it with me uh that this is just a couple a couple three that uh 
I got it. But then this Freddie always said, Freddie said, take pictures of the surroundings. Well, my son actually was out on the lake and I told him, take a picture. This is what it looked like uh, from yes. the boat on the lake. So kind of, kind of a fabulous experience as well as everybody else. But um, I was panicked there for just a short while, making sure that Selena got reset up, but got some, got some, and they, the, the filter is, um, is a filter that uh, uses Rick's, using Rick's uh, sunscreen material. And then, then Keith uh, 3D printed me a filter that fit on Selena. So it was uh, a joint effort here. So anybody else before we turn back to Brent? Yeah, I got a few. <clears throat> no, go ahead. Um, yeah, my little moment was I was going to have my camera controlled by my laptop, but apparently the cable decided to go, I'm not going to work. So I had to freehand it. So I don't know what eclipse that you saw, but if I can find. <laughs> Yeah, so this was the eclipse I saw. I don't know about y'all. So. Hmm. <laughs> no. okay. So I had uh, I had my DSLR with it? me. It was it was the uh, Mantula T3. I had the seventy five to one of the three hundred millimeter lens on it, and so the first one I got. This is a seventy five millimeters. This is all hand shot. I didn't. I took it took it off the um, stand and basically just had to freehand it here. So that's at 75 millimeters. wasn't too bad. You can see one of the little um, prominences right there at the bottom. And of course, you know, it's going to move around a little bit. And started zooming in. Got the, this is at the 300 millimeter. So you got a little bit more, still a little pinkness underneath. Try to bring it out a little more. Try a few of those shots. Brighter. Get more of the, this is like, the, I think this is the second diamond ring. This one here I kind of like the best. And you can see one little uh, prominence on the side. And you got this here, so it's kind of like way overexposed, but at least got something. And that's, I think this was what I posted first was, because uh, I was in Little Rock, and it was kind of a um, let's go little hotel I was at. Um, when it started getting dark, the, the hotel lights in the parking lot just started popping on, so. And I was in there trying to fidget with the camera, getting it plugged in. How come it's not recognizing? How come it's not recognizing it and all this other stuff? And it's like, okay, fine. I'll just unplug it and just freehand it over the car. And it's like, that's what I got. So, and I got a whole lot more, but these were like the best ones out of all the ones I took. It wasn't too bad. Cool. Okay. One last request. Anybody else have any more before we turn it back to Brent? Yeah, I'm having to use two devices. Can you mute one of them? They're both mute. Oh, oh okay. Then you select the screen you want to share. Then there's another little green share button right there in that window area. You got to click on that to sh actually share it. So you have to hit share kind of twice. And he's muted. Or we took a great photo of his name in white letters. Okay. Well, everybody, I can go ahead and get started. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Please. Oh, wait. Okay. There you go. Now, who's doing it? Is that Mylon doing that? Are you seeing it now? Yes. Yeah, there it is. Yes. There you go. You're cutting in and out on, on audio, though. Yeah, I think it keeps muting you. Two, one. Well, this is the video. I don't know if you can hear the audio. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Venus, and Jupiter. Cool. All right. Nice. The crowd sounds help, though. Nobody tried for the comment? Couldn't see that. Uh, no, one, you couldn't see One it. thing at a time. <laughs> Yeah, there were people where we were saying, telling people to look for it, and I was like, I don't think you're going to be able to see it. Now, this is an astrophotography, but the sun funnel was a hit. Nice. I had three different uh, pinhole projectors. And a Earth Moon model. And there's Freddy. There's okay, how do I unshare? And just click it, click it, uh, stop sharing. There you go. Okay, Brent, I think you're cool. Colin. Thank you. Hey, Brian, can right. you get that video up on Facebook or someplace? Uh, I will put on Slack, maybe Facebook too. Excellent. All right. Hopefully, I have my screen coming back across. Yep. All right. Cool. So, yeah, the last little section here. So, I was going to share a little bit about uh, kind of my journey into solar uh, astrophotography. So, um, you know, I, I got started in this planning for the eclipse, which you've seen the end of the journey. But uh, prior to January, I, I've never taken a, a photo of the sun. I've never looked through a telescope at the sun. So uh, I knew I wanted to do the eclipse. So I knew I had to start somewhere. Um, so starting starting with my my journey was figuring out what I wanted to start with. A um, couple of a white light options. So for, for newer people, um, there's a lot of different things that you can do. A uh, simple solar filter, uh, a lot of the, the box or paper or cardboard ones or kind of do-it-yourself solar film ones. The Herschel wedge is a, another option. You put that with your, your eyepiece um, and, and kind of do it that way. And then some more advanced options like the, uh, the eyepiece filters, which I'll, I'll talk about how I got to that point a little bit, or a, a dedicated solar scope. So what I started with and hopefully my camera and PowerPoint is going to come across because I'm going to share a couple things. But um, I started with a um, simple white light uh, cover. Um, I bought this one specifically for the uh, the Eclipse. Um, I probably could have made one for a little bit cheaper, but I knew I wanted to have you know a super solid one, especially with the little clips to to keep it on and, and keep it secure during the process. But that's what I, I started with as well as... Um, uh, a couple of these little solar um, finders. So you can buy these for like 40 or 50 bucks, but uh, 3D printed a couple of these and they they work really well uh, for finding the sun initially. Um, I don't do, I don't use these as much as I did when I first started back in January because of the, the, um, the guiding stuff, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, if you've got this kind of relatively aligned, you can see in my image on the screen uh, let me get my pointer here. You'll see a little dot of, of light in the center to help show you that you're pointing at the sun in the right direction. So um, this is how I, I kind of got started uh, back in January. And my my very first uh, solar picture that I took with this setup, just trying to learn it, um, very similar to planetary imaging. Uh, you're going to record a video. Typically, it's about 30 seconds or less. Uh, you'll stack that video, um, and I use Auto Stacker. And if I have, you know, 2,000 frames, I'll tell it to keep the best 10%. And then you can sharpen it and process the results, and and deal with that in in some uh, other software. And use PixInsight or Photoshop or uh, IMPPG is a good one for uh, sharpening. Uh, that's free. Right. 
Yeah. Brent, are we supposed to be looking at your white light options slide? No. Because it hasn't moved from that. All right. Let's try. And the show. Is it still sharing my screen? Well, it appears to be in the white light options slide with the you're sharing, yeah, kinds of solar filters. Yeah, you're still in the white option slide. Yeah, did you go back? Well, let me do, uh, let me stop sharing and let me turn it back on. Let's see if we can see what it doesn't like here. Where did Zoom go? Share screen two. How's how's that? Picture of the sun. Okay. Move your mouse around. Let's see. There you go. Okay. Let me uh, let me try something real quick. I want to see. Did this slide come through? Yeah, we see you and you see me. Yep. Okay, so I'll show you what I was showing earlier. So this probably didn't come across the first time, but this was the this is the solar filter that I bought to start things out with that I was mentioning, and then the the solar finder, which I've got um, on the screen as well. So let me go back forward again. So yeah, the, this was the first uh, first image that I, I took uh, with the setup, and uh, again, recording the video, stack it, and then do some some post processing. Um, this is what it looks like when I capture it with my color camera through my um, solar filter. So I have to do some false color to get it back to the the sun, you know, looking colors, but. Um, a lot of the imaging uh, that I'm doing at this point is from a mono camera. So a lot of what you see is a false uh, solar color. So you kind of have to plan for that. What, so I started out. What were the oh, steps you do use there real quickly? Yeah, um, to to do that, and I'll, I'll actually show what I'm doing a little bit more okay. in Pix Insight with a, a, a solar toolbox. Makes it a lot easier. Okay. Uh, but what I typically would do uh, beforehand in Photoshop, uh, I would make it a black and white image, then I would make it color again, and then I would open up curves, and I would increase the red and decrease the green and the blue, and that would get it to about this this color shade. So do some sharpening in IMPPG, and then in Photoshop or, or GIMP, uh, for example, if you want to do a, a free a free tool, um, as long as you mess with the curves, again, increase the red, decrease the green, decrease the blue until you get to a nice shade. That's a real quick way to, to get the color right. So I really like the, the images. I like being able to see the sunspots, but I've also seen other pictures of the, the cool details on the sun. So I wanted to get into that. And that's where I got this uh, cork. So the, the solar eyepiece, so I'm going to hold this up and I'll, I'll kind of point at it. Um, is it video coming across for everybody? Yep. Does that work? Okay, good. So um, this cork uh, allows me to connect to my, my telescope. And what I've got here, uh, this, let's see, this part right here is the, the actual cork eyepiece. Uh, I've got a spacer up here that I know this is the right spacer I need for my two telescopes. And then I've got a camera. Uh, this one's a uh, ASI um, 432 camera. And then like uh, Rick was mentioning earlier, I've got a tilt um, right here, a little tilt plate to help get rid of those uh, Newtonian rings. So this is my setup whenever I want to do H alpha imaging. I just kind of attach this whole setup to, uh, to my telescope. And the cork. Uh, I can take off a few of these pieces to to show. So it just slides into uh, an eyepiece holder like that. 
And on one end, uh, I've got a luminance filter and then the, the block, the solar blocking filter. And then on the other piece, other end is just an eyepiece holder that I slot the camera uh, into. So that's that's what it looks like. It's a, a pretty hefty, hefty size. And then on the cork itself, uh, it's got a micro USB plug. And I'll, I'll show what this does, but the entire thing works um, and others can explain the science better than I can, but uh, uh, it's got an Edelon process with power that's going to make the hydrogen alpha show up on the screen. So if I don't plug it in, it's gonna work like a white light filter, but if I do plug it in, it'll work. Um, and I'll show you what it does in just a second. And then it has a little knob here that you can adjust uh, the uh, angstrom setting. So this will help kind of tune what you're actually seeing uh, in the image itself. Um, if you're not getting as good detail, you might have to tweak it a little bit. So I don't mess with this too much. I've, I've got it in a, in a good spot, uh, but these are the, the settings and controls that you can do for it. So the cork um, likes a focal ratio of F30 or higher. So I wanted a way to kind of do this with my uh, refractors that I do have. Uh, and the other thing I forgot to mention as well about the cork, inside of it, it had this particular model, uh, which is the chromosphere model, it has a 4.2x Barlow built into it. So I have to do a little bit of math with my refractors to kind of get to a nice, uh, nice place for it to be optimized. And another way to, to get to that focal ratio was to shrink the aperture at the end of my uh, refractors. So Keith helped me out here to begin with. Um, I won't spend too much time on the math, uh, but he helped on my smaller refractor, uh, kind of did an initial 3D print of an aperture mask that I can put on the front of it. And for my, my smaller refractor here, um, so it's a, an F6, basically, um, right out the gate. If I put the cork on it, 4.2 times the 6 takes me to about 25. So I'm not quite where I need to be. But if I put this on the end of it, it's going to adjust my um, focal ratio to 32.84. So on my refractors, I, I've got this one that I use for my smaller refractor. And then I printed a larger one to use on my Explore Scientific 127. And that helps me get at these much higher focal ratio numbers that the cork uh, wants to work um, optimally with. So this is what it looks like when it's uh, attached to my refractors. Uh, you can see the front end with my aperture masks and then the, the cork itself, it's a pretty, Pretty long back focus I've got to get to to um, to kind of show uh, kind of the distance here, get to my actual focus point. But uh, that that's kind of what it looks like. And in action, so I use SharpCap to capture my images. And this is what just if if I didn't plug in the the cork. So if I just kept it unplugged or let it charged up, it's gonna look the same as a, a white light filter would look. So this is what I, I would see. This is a particular group of sunspots that I, I took. And if I ran through and processed this with the same white light process, you know, it's still a pretty cool image to see. But when it gets really exciting is when you power this thing up. And that'll start the whole Edelon process where it will start pulling out the surface details. So I start to see all the little filaments and all the, the details around the sunspots and the actual surface of the, the chronosphere uh, using that tool. So here you see all the, the nice little waves. Um, and what we're doing to image this, uh, it's the same process I mentioned before. I'm going to do a recording in video and I'm going to stack it. And why we do that, I've got a little video here. Hopefully this will play. So this is just a, a real-time recording of uh, this particular spot. You can see the waviness from both the seeing conditions of the atmosphere, uh, but I think also just kind of the the heat and stuff coming off the, the sun in general. 
but um, the recording is this nice wavy pattern. And then after I stack it and process it, you can see the, the details in a much different way here. So uh, I've got a couple different images of this, but uh, you, you can see a lot more of the surface details here. Uh, really exciting, kind of fuzzy, uh, almost looking uh, capabilities here. I can see some of the, the white uh, of the flares. So this happens to be at a point where some flares were going on here and the white kind of, you know, lightning streaks are active flares inside of those sunspots that uh, you're, you're not going to see in the, the white light version. Um, you, you can probably notice in this picture, I've got a few of the no Newtonian rings as well. So I, I don't have my tilt perfectly dialed in, but it's, it's mostly, mostly clear. So pretty exciting. Uh, what the cork allows you to do is take it from that white light view to a much more detailed um, view of the surface. Now, when I'm doing this, uh, I'm taking images at about two uh, milliseconds. So, um, and a gain of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, was that right? Yeah, gain, gain of 300 is what I had for, uh, for this, uh, this setting. So this, these are the settings I typically use. And the, the Quark, this particular model, it's specifically suited for the solar surface but it can also do prominences. So if I up the exposure from two milliseconds, for example, to 14, well, now all of a sudden I can start to see those outer prominences. And we, we saw several of these in the, uh, the eclipse um, pictures that we were looking at, but uh, getting up nice and close to them by overexposing with the cork uh, allows you to capture those details as well. And I have a couple examples here. Um, uh, this was just the day I was taking screenshots for this presentation. But as I up the exposure, I can just see different types of those prominences coming off the surface. And what that allows you to do is, again, I could take really nice pictures of the surface themselves. But if I've got the, the prominence details as well, I could do some composites uh, to pull out the details of those prominences. So kind of showing a lot of results uh, here at the moment, but uh, I'll talk about the process a little bit more as we go along, uh, but pretty exciting stuff that uh, this little device just kind of opened up this, this whole new world of imaging uh, the sun. Um, it's, it's you know got a nice little price tag to it, but a lot cheaper uh, for me than getting maybe a, a dedicated solar scope that can do all these same, same type things. So when you're capturing this stuff, uh, again, I use SharpCap to do it. Uh, SharpCap's got several tools that are nice. One of them is a, uh, a when the pro version is called a seeing monitor. This uh, can be done in planetary. It can be done on solar as well. But this allows me to turn on basically a sensor and say, I only want to keep frames that are greater than this value. So I can throw away all the bad frames at the time of capture and know that I'm gonna have a really good uh, set of data uh, to make a much more clear uh, set of results with. So the seeing monitor uh, is a pretty cool um, tool inside of SharpCap that helps with this. Once I've captured a video of the sun, uh, I'll process it through Auto Stacker. And this is a, a tool, um, we've, we've seen it looked at for planetary imaging. It works well for the sun as well. And what it allows me to do is do some analysis on the data. And it's going to look at all the frames that I captured in that video, and it's going to generate a quality graph. So I can see wh where are my best frames. And typically what I'll say is I want to pull the best 10% of those frames out and that's, the, that's only the data that I want to use. And then I can stack just that 10% of frames. And then that's what I would then process. So capture the video in SharpCap, stack the video in AutoStacker to get to an individual image. Hey, Brent. 
Have you tried yep. to use a lot less on the uh, alignment points, like maybe a couple hundred instead of two thousand? So I, I did. I did a little experiment before. I've done a lot of the APs and then half and half and half and down. And, I've, and there's, you'll find a sweet spot that might actually work better. And because a lot of people always say you don't need that many alignment points. Some people say, oh, you need only like you know like a hundred or two hundred range. And that's kind of the range I've been in. I used to do you know three hundred, four hundred, a thousand or whatever. I think I find myself find getting better results down in the two to three hundred range. So you might want to try that. I'm gonna. I'll try that. See if no, I appreciate that. that. I'll try that. Details might come out a little bit better. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely try that. So um, I'll talk about some more of the processing in a moment. Um, one of the other items that I do with um, Shark Cap as well. So what you're seeing here, uh, I'll go back uh, a couple frames. So one of the good things and bad things with the um, the cork and that 4.2 Barlow in it is I don't have a full solar disc. So it's going to give me some really nice close-ups of those details, but I can only get certain parts of the uh, the frame at any given time. So one of the nice things that SharpCap has is a solar mosaic tool. And what this allows me to do is it'll take a look at the picture uh, coming through and I can do some alignment. I'll just kind of click forward here a little bit. And Sharp Cap will say something like show point at what the leftmost, you know, side of the sun is. And we'll do some alignment and it's going to go ahead and generate a program here. And it'll capture uh, I probably should have shown the one on my my smaller refractor, but this one is for my Explore Scientific 127. Uh, so this would be a 24 panel mosaic to get the entirety uh, of the sun. So once it generates the 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 mapping here, as long as I've got it connected to my mount, it will go to each of the blocks. It'll take that image, move to the next one, move to the next one, move to the next one, and that entire process, you know, typically it's about 20 seconds per frame. So I can generate a whole mosaic of the, the sun. I can have all that data in just the span of a, a couple of minutes and it'll just automatically move around to where it needs to go. Hmm. So this is, this is an example of what the mosaics look like. Um, you can see a, a pretty big difference from those white light uh, filters. I can see all those filaments and the, the prominences really well, the surface details of the sun, the, the sunspots uh, definitely really pop out. Um, and basically I do what I did earlier. I, I, I'd run it through auto stacker and, and individually stack each uh, photo. Then I would go into Photoshop and then I would use the photo merge utility to go ahead and stitch it together. Uh, which works really well. Um, there are some other tools you can do for this, but Photoshop's, um, I, I've got zero problems just loading the photos and it, it adds them all together and has it nice, nicely combined. And then I'll run through my process once I've stitched it together of, of sharpening it, colorizing it. When you are processing the sun uh, from a color perspective, there's two different color palettes you can use. This upper one, is called the inverted color palette, uh, where the surface details are, are more dark uh, and the prominences are more light. So the top one here, this is a three by two panel that my smaller refractor does, uh, versus down here, I process this one in the bottom right. Uh, this one was a 24 panel mosaic uh, using the normal color palette. So you've got some artistic uh, creativity you can use on which one. I haven't decided which one I like best. It just kind of depends on what I'm working with at the, the moment. But uh, you can kind of process it in different ways and, and see, see different results. Now, one of the other tools, and this one is really a game changer uh, for what I'm doing with solar, but also for what I did for the Eclipse. I mentioned this a couple times earlier. Uh, so PhD2 is what we use to track stars for deep space um, guiding. But uh, Leo Schatz uh, has put together a modification on the PH2 at, um, application. And basically this is for planetary tracking and solar tracking. So what we're able to do for this, and I've included the links down at the bottom for anybody that 
wants to, to check those out. What this allows us to do is inside of the PhD2 application, he's got a new option for planetary tracking. And we can basically turn this option on. There's a few configurable options to kind of right size what the sun's going to look like in your scope. But the same way for for track for guiding that you would do if you're using PhD2, or you can see this in ASI Air, I think, as well. You, you're going to have a, a view of the screen, um, and the, usually it's the stars, but in this case, uh, I've got the sun showing. And I can basically click on the sun, and it's going to detect the, the circular outline of that object. In the same way that we guide on a star, we're going to guide on the sun. So... Um, it moved a little bit here for this shot, but uh, you'll see, and I didn't do a great job of alignment or anything here. So my line's kind of all over the place, but the the sun is big enough that it really doesn't matter. Uh, as long as I've got this tracking on, uh, any drift I have, if I didn't get perfect polar alignment, uh, it's going to keep the sun perfectly where I, I'm looking in my imaging scope. So I, I got a second solar filter and set up my guide scope uh, for to attach and that I've started using that now for any of my solar imaging. Uh, but the, this is really a, a game changer for both. Uh, it, it was for the eclipse. Like I said, I, could, I started this at the beginning and I stayed dead on the sun uh, the entire time, even though I wasn't able to effectively polar align. I, I pointed north and that was about it. Uh, and it, it really kind of allowed me to enjoy that experience. But when I'm doing uh, things like time lapses, I, I don't have to babysit the, the mount anymore. When I first started doing time lapses, I, I did. But now I can start this and I've been going for four and a half hours time lapses uh, on the sun and I don't have to, uh, to deviate from it. So really cool open source modification. Uh, it is a separate install from regular PhD2. I do plan on leveraging this for some planetary uh, work as well when that gets ideal. Uh, but uh, again, uh, Leo Schatz developed this. I'm really hoping it gets folded into the mainline version of PhD2 because uh, it's really an amazing um, uh, capability. Another tool that is super beneficial right now is Pix Insight. Uh, a, a new process was developed called Solar Toolbox. And this allows you to do a lot of the things I was doing in multiple tools all in one go. So with this process in Pix Insight, uh, you can adjust the surface details, you can adjust prominence details, you can adjust the color, sharpening, contrast, all of these different details and it will just automatically adjust and get you to the right color. Um, this one was a white light version I just had open. This one was from my Eclipse um, imaging, but the same thing on the hydrogen alpha uh, occurs with the details. So it really brings out those details and I don't have to work as hard at it as I was in some of the other, other tools. So Solar Toolbox uh, is a, definitely a process worth checking out. I, I threw that link at the bottom of the slide as well. And then the, the final little topic that I'll, I'll discuss here is the time-lapse process. So I've kind of showed how I capture the individual images, but with the time-lapse, what I'm able to do is record the videos um, and I'll record multiple iterations of those videos over the course of several hours. And then I could process them in bulk. I can process the images in bulk through PixInsight and a few other tools. Uh, but what that allows me to do is, and I got some examples here, hopefully these, ah, too far. Um, what this allows me to do is capture multiple images. And typically what I'll do is a 15 second capture with a 15 second delay and then, then another 15 second capture. And I'll do that for several hours. And then I'll process all of those images in bulk. So auto stacker, I'll, I'll load all the video files and it'll just run through them and, and create my stacked image. IMPPG, 
I use right now to align the images because things move a little bit, even though you're guiding, this will make sure everything's lined up uh, pretty well. And then Pix Insight, I can use a, a, a bulk processing tool to sharpen and colorize using the solar toolbox uh, that I just showed you. And then once I have all that information, I can use uh, PIP to put it together in an animated GIF or a video file. So this is one of the examples that I, I, I've shared this on our Slack channel, but uh, I'll press play in a second. But the first thing to watch here, um, this is really cool. This was over the span of about three and a half hours. The first thing to watch is this prominence in the upper left-hand corner um, because it's going to get really fast and crazy and then it's going to slow down. And then a little bit later, you'll see some white um, solar flare pops inside of this sunspot. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play here. And if you saw that, it'll, it'll play back in reverse here in a moment. Uh, the real whippy kind of circular motion of that prominence. Um, down here, we should start seeing some of the color pops. We can see kind of the, the bubbling nature of the the sun here. Uh, let's see if we see any more of those white pops. Yeah, there's a couple of them right here going on. But uh, it, it's really cool. You can just kind of put together and see the actual motion of the sun. You can see these filaments and prominences actually moving and pulsating. Um, and this one I thought was really cool just because of how fast that circular whipping motion was. And then it slowed down to kind of a slower slower pace. So this is kind of really exciting stuff. Um, I put together, uh, actually, this is an approximate size of the Earth as well. I, I threw that on there for fun so you can kind of get an idea for how, you know, the size of this prominence whipping around here is the size of the, the Earth. And then this is another one that I did um, focused only on the, the prominence. So I overexposed the entire images and then I kind of blacked out the surface of the sun. But the, um, the prominence here, we can see that motion of it. We can see a, another looping prominence way back here in the corner. But I like this one. It just kind of looks like a, a little fire dragon flying around the, the top here, whipping around in a, in a circle. So kind of a really cool experience. The, the cork kind of open the door for me to be able to do this stuff uh, and just using the existing refractors I have. And uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of fun. I could set it up uh, in the middle of the day so I don't have to worry about uh, um, clouds or the moon, or I guess I do have to worry about clouds, but um, I could set it up in the middle of the day and, and get a lot of cool captures and then do some more nighttime imaging uh, once, once all said and done. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour of uh, kind of my journey. Again, it started out as an effort to figure out white light solar so I could be ready for the eclipse. And it's kind of ballooned into this hydrogen alpha time lapse and all kinds of, of cool surface uh, details of the, of the sun. Well, you could write a manual on this. <laughs> Excellent. Brent, when you... Uh... Do your mosaic and your I assume it's when you're capturing you're doing 20 second per panel the first time you actually see the full disc is once you bring it into Photoshop is that right yes um, so I'll only see uh, again if you think about that frame uh, that I had earlier I'll go back to where was it uh, this one so what I would see is just an image of this upper corner and then an image of this side and then an image of this lower corner. And then the first time, like you said, the first time I'll see that disc um, after I've stacked each of the individual videos, the first time I'll see the full disc is when I do the photo merge inside of uh, Photoshop. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's why I went with a uh, dedicated uh, hydrogen alpha because my primary interest is in outreach, and I want to be able to show a full disc, you know, right in front of people's face. Um, yeah. I have the same uh, same scope as Freddie has, actually. Yeah, that's it's one that I, I looked at doing. I, I wanted to 
part of the reason I went with the cork um, price on some of those was was one reason. But another one was I, I wanted to be able to see different variations. So it's real easy to do the mosaic on the smaller uh, one. But with being able to attach this to my larger Explore Scientific allows me to get really close on some of the details. So the eyepiece filter kind of puts me in a really good spot to do both. Now, I think you can, and I don't know much about this, I think with probably what like Barlow's and, and Powermates and stuff like that, you can probably accomplish a lot of the same things with a, a dedicated scope that has it full disc. Yeah, the uh, the, F, the desired F ratio, I would use a two and a half um, Powermate uh, with the camera that I'm using, which is the 533. Um, but then I would have to use uh, a computer to get full disk. And I'm trying to avoid using a computer in the field. Yeah. Yeah. With the, with my smaller refractor. So the, the William optics 70 millimeter, um, there is a path for me to get full disk in a single shot by getting a, a 0.5 reducer. Um, I haven't gone down that path yet. It's something that I might do uh, at some point just to see if I can get it in there. Um, but yeah, for, for now, I found the mosaics is, is, is pretty easy to, to put together and process. Well, your work is certainly impressive. Yes, it is. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, the good thing is this is being recorded and it's going to be recorded for posterity for people to use. So. Okay, anything else for Brent before we close this off? Nope. Can I have the screen back for a, a second? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me... There it is. Stop. Brent, Brent what's, right. your, what's your reduce? Who are you looking for for the 127? Um, it wouldn't be for the 127. Uh, it would be if I get a, an, an 0.5... A uh, little simple reducer on my smaller um, William Optics Xenostar, I can fit full disc on it. So okay. it's probably like a, a little cheap, like a GSO, um, you know, probably like twenty dollar one or something. Could should hypothetically be able to do it. I've seen other people do it online, but I, I haven't messed with it yet. But you're not even going to try to get there with the one twenty seven, right? No, I definitely can't get to full disc on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're going to wrap, wrap it up for tonight, but let's let's think about next month. We What we have is a future agenda items. Um, we've had this on there for several times, but just kind of an open discussion of what people use for the camera settings, uh, as I've got written here. Um, anybody had any experience with a new gradi gradient correction tool? No. Okay. Well, I I've played with it a little bit, and I've I've also played with the, the graph uh, graph expert, whatever it is, and I've also done the uh, few others. But oh, yeah, it's the mixed results depending on what you're trying to do. It, it it works good on certain things and not so good on some other things. So, well, maybe maybe we just have some discussion. Maybe even have some examples uh, that we can play with on that. It, it, Steve, anything you were you were the one I think had the Mars project. Is anything worth updating us on that? That that's going to be a very important presentation when it becomes live. Okay. It's not ready they're, yet. They're they're still gathering a lot of data, and uh, basically, the, any image it'll it'll plate solve your image, analyze the nebulae in it, and do do a a perfect gradient correction without destroying any nebulas or anything like that it's just cool yeah okay um is there a time frame for that like in the next year or? they're they're behind schedule okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're 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 struggling with some things that they actually they, they developed the module for w wbpp to run it uh and uh it's it, it's going to link there, there's a little section there, I think, on the uh, uh, that last tab that allows you to choose uh, 
the gradient scripts that will, okay. that will solve all this. So they, they, they've got the infrastructure ready. They're just, I think they're just, they just need data to, to make sure that it, it does proper gradient corrections. Okay. Um, any, are there any other topics we want to cover next month? Anything people like to discuss? Okay. Well, how about drop me a note if you do, uh, but this is what will be the basis of the next meeting and, uh, and plus any additional uh, materials you send me. So fabulous presentations tonight by Rick and Brent. Um, real, real professional work and wow. So anybody else? Ready to call it a night? All right, I'm going to stop recording here if I can. Um, and this will be rendered here pretty quick.